Ah, good evening, all of you beautiful South Africans who've uh, joined us this evening in this special webinar tonight with myself, Marianne Tam, uh, Dr. Raji Bidin, our guest, and Desi Rasmus, our Daily Maverick reporter who's been on the ground the last week, along with many other of our journalists. Welcome to all of you. Happy Mandela Day. Um, and we're here for a crucial discussion about our country and where we are, what's just happened. Let's make sense of it. Um, some of you have submitted a hell of a lot of questions beforehand. We've got them all. Um, we're going we're gonna to give you time. We'll go through those questions. If you want to chat, put a little message in chat. Hello, everybody from everywhere. Ireland, uh, KZN, all of you, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, let's begin. I just wanted to say that, you know, this has been a rupture this week of the old ways, um, or at least of the, the old ways that no longer work. Uh, it's been, you know, a rupture of the economy, of ethical leadership, of business. Uh, and this in the middle of a pandemic and stage four lockdown after a year of South Africans taking a pounding in every other way. It couldn't have come at a worse time. Uh, some of us knew that uh, this would happen at some point. We could feel that whatever was going on in South Africa was no longer sustainable. Uh, the in attitude politically and the hollowing out of the state in many ways and the loss of 54 billion in state capture was always going to at some point manifest itself visibly in South Africa. It has already in the poverty which many of us haven't seen or know about and every day understand. Uh, nothing will be the same, not government, not South Africans, not the instigators. 200 people are dead, 1,000 troops on the streets. Uh, let's begin to talk about it. Des, tell us a bit about your reflections. You were there from the night Mandela was whisked off to escort uh, till today. Uh, just tell us a bit about where we are now and your feelings about the week. Just to correct you there, it was Zuma who was whisked off to escort, not Mandela. But um, being Oh my Mandela. God, did I say Mandela? Yeah. <laughs> you see how, you see <laughs> Can you see how much um, is in my consciousness? <laughs> um, Thank Marianne, you, Mandela. I know we mentioned it. It's been a hell of a ride. Go for it, Des. It's been um, emotional. It's been traumatic. And when I speak, I'm not speaking only as a journalist. I'm speaking to somebody who lives in one of the suburbs that was severely affected. Um, the three malls within a, say, seven kilometer radius from me were looted. Um, the damage is unbelievable. Um, we started to hear eruptions on, I think it was Thursday evening, the first night of um, Jacob Zuma's incarceration, about trucks being burnt, and it escalated from there. I just have to point out that trucks being burnt in KwaZulu Natal is not a new thing. We've been experiencing this for years. Um, we have national government stepping in. We have task teams being set up, but nothing changes. Um, and and that is that is one of the things that have to be addressed. So that our um, our logistics industry, our freight industry, is really it's it's almost it's on its knees almost constantly. And not only because of of what they are losing, but because of um, just as an apathy and inability for government to assist. Um, so anyway, we've got these ructions on Friday. Um, by Saturday, it was clear that there was something was different. I think all the journalists that I know, I'm on quite a few journalist groups, and we all knew that something was different. By Sunday, that feeling had set in. Um, and this is as the looting just started. Um, and it just escalated. Uh, as I say, in my area, um, there was a sense of absolute disbelief. It was surreal. I live in an incredibly multiracial area in um, towards the south of the city, um, what you would call a poorer area. Um, and it was absolute devastation that I saw and I heard when talking to my neighbours. Um, my neighbours from other um, African countries did not leave their homes. They're very well aware of what happens when this kind of violence flares, that it usually turns towards them. Um, the devastation that I saw was unprecedented. I have never seen this. I've been a journalist for a long time. I was born and bred in KZN. I have never seen this before. All of my colleagues were saying exactly the same thing. Um, the gunshots at one stage where I stay were incessant. 
Um, I have stayed around close to Durban for a long time. There have always been gunshots. There's always been crime. This was something different. Um, and I think the most startling thing, the thing that almost broke my brain on Wednesday was that a lot of the people who were doing the looting stayed in the suburbs around me and in my own. Um, I physically saw people taking stuff um, from Queensmead Mall, a mall that is close to me, going into flats, going into houses in the area. Um, and that, I think, was when I reached my lowest point as a, as a, <laughs> as a resident, as a South African. Um, that being said, what I'm experiencing now as I sit here is um, a sense of renewal, a sense of hope that I honestly thought by Wednesday I had lost. Um, as I was telling you guys previous to this, um, when my husband and I just, were packing just, just up. Just tell us, we, we were in the group. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. In, in, the, so uh, when, that, when, that story you told us in the you told, you told us yes. the story in the green room, which I think is, yeah. is, closes off the week in terms of your your idea of, of helping, of going out and helping. So, and then I'll let so My husband in. and I were gearing up. My whole family was gearing up to go and clean up our mall. And it had already been cleaned. So people were just going down and helping without having to be called. There were a lot of calls going out, but um, it, people were just unbelievable. The response was, was something I have never experienced before. You know, it's, really, it's usually really difficult to rally people for a good cause. 10% um, of people end up doing 90% of the work. And in this case, it simply wasn't that way. Thank you for that. I mean, I love this idea that you were rallying people to clean up a, up a mall, totally trashed, and you get there and it's already clean. Iraj, welcome. Thank you very much. You've had lots to say about South Africa um, uh, getting to this point economically. Your thoughts on the last week, where we are now, and we did speak earlier on that we must spend quite a lot of time talking about where do we go from here. Um, your idea, do you, do you agree with the president and the government's notion that this was a planned, inst uh, an instigated insurrection? And, and what are your thoughts about the impact of that? I think there is no uh, greetings to everybody. And thank you for inviting me here. It is really a privilege to, to be here. Uh, and of course, like all other South Africans, I'm, I'm, I'm of mixed emotions. Um, it is highly disappointing um, to see that... Um, We've reached in our democracy to where we are. At the same time, uh, as a constitutional democracy, like all other constitutional democracies, we cannot expect to have a smooth evolutionary path. There will be moment, uh, watershed moments where the nation has to choose its future. And I believe, sad and tragic as these events are, it has brought us as a nation to a point of making hard choices. Um, it is no ordinary faction fight between two group of comrades within the ANC. It is not. For me, it's about a line in the sand between those who want to have a country of the future that is a constitutional democracy. That's the vision of Mandela. And today we, we celebrate um, his, his sufferings and his contribution to the nation. And all of us have to be very, very clear as to what we are facing. It is not an ethnic mobilization, and I'm glad that President Ramaphosa has corrected himself. And uh, clearly, it has highlighted big, big gaps in our society, in the governance of our society. Uh, a society that uh, we know we have all kinds of differences. We are almost a microcosm of the global ch challenges that humanity faces in, in the form of maldistribution of income, uh, management of diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yet, knowingly, president after president, they have talked about and they have done very little about. And over the past 10 years, it has gotten worse because two types of hollowing out of public uh, infrastructure has happened. One, billions, you mentioned 54 billion. We don't know the number, but let's take it for now. 54 billion has been stolen from the poor and from the nation. Secondly, we have hollowed out. The, the, the machinery of the state, the infrastructure of the state. And we've seen it once again over the past week that our security systems, our, our police force, our uh, intelligence coordination, our speed with which the, the cabinet should respond 
has left much to be desired. Yes, the president has acknowledged it, and yet we need to do something about it. The exciting part for me, Marian, is that uh, we can see that the spirit of Mandela in action. We see there's mentioned about uh, people volunteering to 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 clean up the 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 moles that have been scorched. And it is important to know why the moles have been, in my view, and I've been highlighting or uh, studying it very carefully, this particular uh, uh, scorched earth strategy that these um, instigators of, of, of insurrection or coup d'etat for any better term have been putting it is to destroy the economy, to destroy the, the infrastructure of the regional national economy. And therefore, we see the nation responding ordinary citizens, taxi drivers, uh, community members. Uh, and it's, it's beautiful to see it's a cross-racial grouping. It's a cross-economic strata. So I think it is a moment that we need to think and reflect deeply uh, and make some very, very tough decisions going forward to build the foundation for the new phase of the consolidation of South Africa's constitutional democracy. Right, I think we, we're a little way off from, from this consolidation and we see an ongoing contestation by Jacob Zuma, who is now at his criminal trial on Monday, going to ask for, to make a special plea. I think, uh, Des, um, you're, you know, we do know that the South African police have been deeply uh, compromised in the Zuma years. Uh, I've been writing about, uh, uh, and also the state security agency, we've heard shocking testimony at the Zonda mm -hmm. Commission. People have been named uh, specifically uh, in that commission who are still operative and work in government. Uh, just first of all, the police's response, uh, in your view, uh, on the ground at KZN when it began to happen? Was it adequate? Did you feel they were aware? Were they able to work with uh, what was rolling uh, out in, 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 at the hotspots everywhere? The response was wholly inadequate. Mm -hmm. There was no response. Um, let me give you an example. When our mall was burning, I contacted somebody in the police It was very senior uh, via WhatsApp. Um, and I said to him, this is what's happening. Are you able to help? And he said, at the moment, I'm patrolling my area and my wife's bucky. Um, this, and, and I cannot hold that against him. I, I can't. I simply can't. Um, I know that when, when one of the community groups in our area was formed, um, it was because of a direct relationship between the community groups, the, the leader of one of the community groups, the patrol, and... Um, and the, the local commander at the police station. Um, and that was because the police were honest and they said, look, we do not have the resources. At one stage, Marianne, we had eight active um, police officers on duty for the entire Ambilo Glenwood Berea area. I mean, that is ridiculous. Um, as an example, today, again, I drove through the streets of, of Durban with my husband. We went to the beachfront we went through the city center. We went all the way through Musgrave, Berea, our areas in Ambilo. There was nothing. I think we saw two police cars, um, no SANDF. So I understand the SANDF on N3. They are bringing food down. Um, sorry, they are, they are manning convoys. You know, they are, um, I understand that. But where are the police? Um, and and this, this is the problem with many residents is that my husband and I on Friday, when we were coming back from um, Kwamashu, where President Cyril Ramaphosa was, um, saw the only police that we saw were there. When we got back into our neighborhood, we got a call that there was a, an, a shooting about four blocks up from us. We got there. It turned out to be a false alarm, but there were 13 police cars there. And the reason that they were there was because it was allegedly one of their own who had been involved in something, who could have been under attack. I understand that. I understand the blue line. But good grief. Um, if they can mobilize that quickly, can they not come to communities um, like mine, like, like those of every other person in KwaZulu-Natal? I, I have to put, I have to be very honest here. I feel for them. Um, I really do. I think they do immense work with what they have. But it's the fat cats who have to get their act together. 
and ensure that budgets are increased and that training is amplified, um, or else we, we, are, we are just not going to get out of the cycle. But you also look at SAP's leadership. I think the cops on the ground, I've met many of them. I've met many wonderful, ordinary working policemen. But we have Absolutely. at top SAPs, we, we have it, we have it, you know, 20 of the senior leaders are appearing in court for various charges yeah. of corruption. We have people sitting in crime intelligence at the moment facing serious charges. A internal audit report shows that 1.6 billion was spent in six months in SAPs yeah. on corrupt PPE tenders. They, they deny that this is the case, but it's true. So what the seeing actually on is in steps leadership a complete breakdown and a drawing into Jacob Zuma's uh, um, you know crime intelligence and the secret service funders with Mdluli, uh, and no permanent head has access to enormous amounts of money and intelligence Iraj um, your uh, your thoughts on uh, policing uh, this defense force bringing that in what does that mean uh, and and what does it show us about what we should do about policing and top leadership I think, Marianne, the, the, what we see in the police and, and the army and, and national security structures is really no different from other government departments. Uh, for obvious reasons, we are now focusing on policing and the army. But for decades, for years, people have been talking about lack of water in the communities, lack of health facilities. It's not as if the money is not there. The money is not used effectively. In essence, we have hollowed out competence, and technical expertise per sector, be it in the policing, being in the army, be it in water, be it in uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. So we have let go of the, the, the capacity and the purpose of um, a state. The purpose of the state is to be competent to serve the nation and most importantly to serve the poor. Now, of course, when a crisis like this happens, uh, we can see the police because our own safety and life is at risk. Uh, but I submit that we should pay attention. And that's one of the key uh, uh, watershed moments that we need to not tolerate the lack of capacity and hollowing out of, of the skills from within the pub public sector. And of course, the fact that uh, it, it appears to me, and I think if I read between the line of what President Ramaphosa is saying, is that they knew this insurrection is happening, but they thought it's going to be attacking different type of infrastructure. They're going to be the oldest style coup d'etats and the oldest style uh, type of disruption. They did not uh, assume, did not operate on the basis that this group is going to go for the destruction of our economic infrastructure. And this is very critical. When we come to solution how to go forward, we cannot leave it to the state. We cannot and should not. And the government in any case cannot, does not have the resources and the expertise. So my reading is that what we see in the police and, and the army and the national security is really symptomatic of the entire public sector. We need to rethink it, revive it, and take it very seriously, not just talk about it. Uh, Iraj, you mentioned earlier on when Des mentioned there was no SADF in the suburbs, that it was important to, to um, uh, look at the how this plot unfolds, because it's quite clearly yeah. a plot now. Just yeah. give us a bit of your insight into what you think the objectives are of a grouping of people inside the governing party, uh, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, plotting against its own government. What are the objectives? I think it's quite clear to me uh, that the objective is uh, to destroy the, the economic underpinning of commerce, domestic commerce, because that leads to nation's frustration. When there is no food and there is no bread and there is no basic medicine, rest assured that is a recipe for racial war, community war, and uprising of all kinds. So instead of attacking the army barracks and SABC uh, broadcasting, which was the oldest star, they are destroying factories, they are destroying distribution centers, they are distribu dis destroying shopping malls. It is unprecedented. We have not seen any in any other coup d'etat that people uh, destroy shopping malls. <laughs> We've seen they are attacking army barracks and the president's office, etc., etc. To the extent that those who are behind this increasingly is quite clear that they are not foreigners, they, are with, they have been employees of our national security system. They have been employees of uh, possibly at the highest level of, 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 of a strategic policymaking, et cetera, et cetera. 
My reading is that they are going to, to paralyze. That is their strategy, to paralyze the economy. Therefore, coming back to Deze's point, uh, uh, if I ask myself, if I had limited police and, and, and military capacity, what would I put it, uh, what would I use it for in this plot that they are doing? I would protect, uh, as they have been doing, protect what matters for people's uh, livelihood, for their ordinary subsist uh, sustenance, um, access to basic food, shopping centers, distribution centers, factories, etc., etc. So I think that's what, what we are faced as the reality, and we need to now mobilize to support that because it is not a war of people against people. It's a war of some selected, highly capable, highly resourced, and highly uh, trained in what they are doing to, to undermine the economy. Sorry, there's, I just wanted to ask you here, um, the KZN, we know, uh, you know, has been for a very long time pre, uh, pre-democracy and afterwards a very contested terrain with enormous uh, levels of violence, an enormous amount of anarchy in terms of the economy, the taxi bosses, um, and Jacob Zuma very much being the, the, um, the face of the ANC in, uh, in KZN, being deployed there in earlier years to sort of quell the violence between Inkata and the ANC, but then very much as a patron of those in that region who support him. Gumede, Etiquini region, on Sunday when I was at Inkanda, it was quite clear a bus had come in of those supporters. Inkandla was at Ward 1 by um, uh, Inkata in, in years before. So even where Jacob Zuma lives, there isn't necessarily that much support for him. I think people often people see Zuma in the KZN as a, as a bothersome Trump, in a way, you know, a family that brings trouble to, to the province, and some of us support him, some of us don't. Um, you know, you've lived there for a long time. Do you think this is, you know, what is the uh, um, what are the objectives? I mean, the ten, the people have got very rich, very, very rich in, in KZN uh, as a result of tenders and connections and politically. We've had uh, the NPA compromised. We've had crime intelligence compromised. Uh, give us a sense of, 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 of that for you now and whether that is sustainable in the eruption of this terrible violence which has been rejected by the people. I, I think it's important that no matter how much we say Jacob Zuma doesn't have a lot of support. He does have good support in KZN. I think we have to acknowledge that. And even if his support is amongst the so-called RET faction, it's support. Um, there is a very um, well-established patronage network here um, that we're all very very much aware of. And uh, where is Atten Kandla over the weekend? What we saw in some areas... Um, when mobilization takes place now, it could be, if I could describe it this way, the rats and mice on the on the floor picking up the corn. Um, so that's kind of what it's become now because there isn't that that direct um, ability to um, to loot. Um, the, the people are kind of um, gripping for the scraps. But um, I would just like to reiterate again that he does have very good support here. He also has support within the ANC in the province. Um, whereas they might not support some of what he says now, they support him because of his struggle credentials. Um, Mayor Nolisi um, Kawinda is a big supporter. Um, so is Sichle Zikalala. Um, and then we all know, of course, about um, Zandela Gomedi. Whether this is sustainable or not after this, I, I, unfortunately, I'd have to say yes. I, w I would say I can't say, see it changing anytime soon. Zuma has done a lot in his area in particular for the folks on the ground. And that's something that you that you cannot get away from. Um, he is unlike any other politician in that he isn't. He doesn't try to be something that he's not. He's not a Westerner. You know, he's proud of being Zulu. He's proud of his heritage. Um, and I think that resonates with a good deal of the population. Um, but I don't... Unfortunately, I don't see that it is going to die down after this. Well, it's interesting also that that this comes with 
the death of King uh, Goodwill Zelatini um, and a new young king needing to hold together Zulu people, I think it's also important for people to know that Jacob Zuma does not embody the Zulu nation, that he yes. is not somebody who embodies uh, Zulu Natal and the kingdom. There's a lot about the, the region and the area that isn't linked to Zuma, that is beautiful on its own and it has its own stuff. Iraj, your sense of uh, this entrenched group of kleptocrats in the region, um, uh, having weirdly enough, the idea of radical economic transformation is based Basically, you know, burn it all down and start again, and just I don't know, give it to everybody else. What, what is the, what is the, what is the? It's just it's against government. Iraj, your thoughts on that? I think the reality of modern economy is that whatever those beliefs might be, um, that is not workable. And let me give you one example. Uh, uh, Toyota South Africa, the biggest uh, industrial complex in in, in KZN and possibly the pride of South African auto manufacturers, has now issued a statement addressed to the mayor that they are seriously reconsidering their operations in KZN. And let me also assure you that Toyota is not the only one. People have to rethink if this is the way KZN operates, if this is how the political leadership sees patronage, prosperity, and uplifting of people's they cannot operate that. It's too expensive, too risky. And after these events, all of them are going to go back to the drawing board. And this comes, unfortunately, at a time that auto industry globally rethinking massive investment in changing from diesel and petrol to electric. And that means multi-year, possibly two decades long type of investments. And Toyota is going to, to have to think re really seriously, do they want to stay there or not? And I submit that unless our national government and provincial governments, irrespective of their political uh, allegiances, whether they are pro-Zuma, anti-Zuma is neither here nor there. The reality is that unless the environment is made workable for investors, both local and, and international, that province is going to suffer the consequences of the type that the patronage that this talk about will fall into insignificance. People are going to be very, very cautious and they are not going to any longer listen to what is said. Investors and businesses are going to watch what is done, not what is said and the statements that are read. So I'm very concerned uh, that if, if the political leadership at the provincial level and national level do not move quickly and consistently, we could see a lot of flight of capital and jobs and uh, opportunities away from KZN, which, is, which would be highly unfortunate, and we need to do everything we can to avoid it. That answers a question by Walter Dubel, who says, who asks, will we see an increased capital outflow and what is the longer term effect? I think you've answered that question there. Um, you know, uh, Des, as far as the ruling party is concerned, uh, the, the Minister of State Security says they knew on the 28th of June they'd intercepted various uh, potential threats, but yet it feels as if uh, nothing could be done. Iraj, you said earlier on that they mm -hmm. kind of sat back and thought, oh, well, it won't be, you know, which shows a terrible, you know, uh, out of touch. We've all been warning for a very long time, disband the SSA, fix up crime intelligence. You know, they are, we have to suspend those members in SAPs. At the moment, there's no more game playing who are implicated in any corruption and some mm -hmm. sort of step aside rule must be there. People must accept that if they are implicated, they must step aside. The ANC itself, um, I don't know, Des, your feeling on the response from the, the government. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the response from people. And then we're going to go into... Uh, future prospects here. Also, the testing of, of the Constitution. You said earlier on Jacob Zuma is a traditionalist. Uh, uh, Helen Ziller would agree with you. And I see it today that she's been attacked for saying that by some people saying, do you think that us Africans are so stupid we don't understand the Constitution? I think that Helen was just saying that Jacob Zuma embodies something else. And, mm. and it's a dangerous nationalism, once again, claiming Zuludom, Zuluness for himself when it's actually not necessarily rested in him. Um, your feelings on uh, what what is going to happen in the party? Uh, Zandili Gumedi is facing charges. Um, uh, you know what the government does with this region now matters a lot, uh, and it failed on, on on all levels. It failed. Yeah, Marianne, my way of thinking, and this is just me, and I I speak as um, as a KZN citizen. I'm um, I believe that if the ANC wants to go forward in KwaZulu Natal, it has to renounce. Um, factions that are obviously bringing it into disrepute. 
and there has to be a culling. And I'm sad to say I don't see that happening. Again, this is because of a lot of patronage networks that, that have been formed. Um, what the ANC needs to do now will not happen. There are some incredibly good people in the ANC at the moment. There are some MECs that I think are outstanding. Um, I happen to think that the, the secretary in KwaZulu-Natal, um, Dumaseni Ntuli, is um, a fabulous politician. Um, but there is a there is a procrastination um, that I can't see um, falling away. And purely because I think there are such strong ties to the past of, um, you know, this one did this for us. He may have looted, but, you know, he's actually a good guy. He was with us in the struggle. That's not a secret. Um, but for it to thrive in, 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 in KZN, it's going to have to cull. And the culling is going to have to be quick um, and it's going to have to be brutal. And unfortunately, I do not see it happening. Iraj, your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I do not know on the political side, but I can assure you that if, if uh, it does not happen uh, quickly and openly and legally, <laughs> uh, mm. it's going to undermine South Africa's uh, economic ranking. Remember, we are already sub-investment sub grade. Uh, we are struggling in terms of our growth. Our global growth rating is done. And what has been in our favor over the past 20 years has been the rule of law, the respect for property, the constitutionality. And it is important to highlight that uh, the South Africa is the only emerging economy that has opted for constitutional democracy. And that we have used, and um, I've had the privilege of, uh, and I still do, in uh, almost weekly engagement with, with investors, especially those who hold South African bonds, uh, private and public bonds, they are very, very uh, assured by the fact that we have a constitutional democracy, um, mm -hmm. unlike many other emerging economies. Now, if South Africa let go of that, and that means, what does it mean in action for investors? It means the rule of law. It means justice to be done and to be seen to be done. And it means gradually and steadily weaning and embedding the rule of law and, and respect for property rights. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if we don't do that quickly after what has happened, no longer the president or the, anybody else in the country can suggest that we don't know what's happening. We don't know who is behind it. We don't know how it happened. Um, there are unknown forces. No, there are known forces. The market knows, you know. Uh, and uh, if, if, if in the national security people don't know, then they should be sacked because everybody knows. And journalists have done a wonderful job of of uh, of uh, bringing a lot of facts to the to the table. So, uh, uh, from an economic point of view, it's critical that it be done very quickly, painful and hard as it might be. I just wanted to add here: people shouldn't forget the effect of the Zondo Commission, which is part of our constitutional democracy, in the yeah. in in having the perpetrators, in their own words, um, uh, talking in front of a nation over the last how many years? And so it's not me, the media, telling you what Malusi Gigaba did or uh, David Matlaw, but they themselves. And you get to see these people themselves and I also contributed a hell of a lot whether we take it into account or not with the general consciousness of ordinary South Africans that we won't put up with these people anymore. I just quickly wanted to speak about the role of media in this as you mentioned journalist uh, Iraj uh, doing extraordinary work young journalists I've been so proud of, they're so proud of, they've stood their ground. Many of us come from the old days with tear gas and other stuff. Um, but then social media, um, we see then how it has been deployed, weaponized, and how the poor have been weaponized also through social media. We've got this huge number of people who are, have access to, to social media platforms. Um, ideas on, on the role of media here, false information, and have we dealt with that uh, well enough uh, in these really, really tinderbox situation? Uh, let's begin with you, Des. Well, Marianne, you know, I, I had a bit of a mini breakdown on Wednesday because I was I was exhausted and I was getting information from all sides. I have never been bom as bombarded a, a, as you guys were as well with information. And so I was trying to sift through it as a journalist, trying to get back to the original source. And then as a human being sitting in my home, um, with my two elderly parents on the property as well, worrying about their safety. So um, 
it 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 is an immense problem. The voicemails that are going around that are um, obviously designed to terrify people are problematic. Um, I have I have heard so many, and you know, it's not it's not too difficult to concern, to discern in some of the cases because, for example, the one you can recognize they all come from the same woman. There's one that comes from the same man. You know, so so these are things that you you look at and you say, mm, yeah, okay. But the majority of the public can't. And the majority of the public don't have the skills that a journalist does to be able to to kind of hone in and find out where the original source is. I was very much, um, prior to this, I was very much um, not particularly perturbed about people doing stupid things like sending voicemails. I tell you, my, my mind is, is, is totally made up now. I think that the consequences for doing that have to be harsh. I mean, the, the amount of rubbish that is out there and the amount of misinformation, it, it is absolutely terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And I, and I, I would just like to thank my, um, my journalist colleagues, particularly the ones in KZN who I've been in contact with. Um, good grief, the job that they are doing where they have to be on the ground, I'm a broadcast journalist in particular, um, who have to sift through information some of them wearing rubber bullets, um, helmets, going into places. Um, it terrifies me. I've really been scared on behalf of my colleagues. But they have, you know, millennials in, in, in particular have this immense ability to juggle so many things in their brains. <laughs> and um, it's just been such a learning curve for me to see how they're doing it. I am so immensely proud of them. Um, yeah, so just just thank you to them. And, and of course, we have this, the, the president's daughter uh, tweeting as well, encouraging. We have other people uh, using social media. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we can talk about that later. Iraj, your idea of the media, and then I want us to just uh, quickly then sp speak about the response of South Africans and then talk about the economy recovery. I think, Marianne, we always talk about the age of disruption, and possibly nowhere can we see that better than in terms of uh, the so-called communication and media and the spread of news, both real and fake. But as, as President Ramaphosa quite po uh, aptly pointed out, the media has really glorified themselves over the past uh, 10 days or so. Uh, some might say over the past 10 years, but definitely over the past 10 days, they have been a, a source of uh, uh, demonstrating what the thing is all about, mm -hmm. but at the same time highlighting and some of the real South Africans on the ground doing what possibly in the past their police and the army and others would have done. And that's a wonderful role that media, in my view, has played to keep the society informed, but also bring them somehow together. I think, let me just, there's an interesting question here. Are we going to move to some of them? Somebody has says, uh, Riraj and Des, both of you might answer this. What influence does a possible third force have? For example, globalists like, uh, I suppose, China, Russia, the Guptas, you know, so many other people who, uh, and the United States perhaps. I mean, if you look at, interestingly enough, the Republican Party and Trump and how they didn't deal with him, <coughs> for me, bear some correlations between uh, Zuma and, and, the, and the global uh, move towards, I suppose, a kind of extractive economy and an abusive economy. Um, uh, it, are there outside influences here? Any, any sense of that? Um, if I may, uh, uh, I don't know. Is my view is that it's a, it's a what I call it a mega trend in the global society. That societies are irrespective of whether they are the United States or or or, or India or South Africa or, or whatever, they are under the influence of this changing equilibrium in the global economy. There are basically leaders who want to go back to the past. They are nationalistic, they are supremacist, whether they are tribalist or not, is neither here nor there. And there are those who want to see the future. They see a, a humanity which is integrated, which is united, which is coherent, a different breed of human beings. And that is the world over. We see the manifestation of it here, as we've been discussing over the past while, the United States is battling it with, it with Trump and against others. And uh, Europe sees it its, its own way, etc., etc. So I believe that we should not underestimate this, the effect of this mega trend in the global, uh, let's call it the social political equilibrium of the world. We cannot do 
we cannot govern the societies the way that we have been doing it in the past. And political leaders, the majority of them, are not fit yet to reimagine the new society. Let's, let's, let's maybe go there for a bit for a second before we take some other questions. But I want to just ask something that I thought about during lockdown in the beginning, the very hard lockdown with the ban of tobacco. Now, you know, British American tobacco hasn't covered itself in glory in South Africa. It's implicated in the SARS attack. It's implicated in various other, I suppose, global contraventions. And I watched as a network, you know, because of the ban of tobacco, almost uh, enabled ordinary people who've never had access to the economy, particularly in KZN, smuggle illegal cigarettes and grow a little bit of a business. One guy I know bought a bucky and now he's running, you know, he's running his own show. In that lacuna, where he, you know, ordinary people were able to step in and somehow take over the distribution. And I thought to myself, what's the difference between, let's say, British American tobacco, who might not be paying as much tax as they should be, and actually the redistribution of, a, of an industry, let's say, let's take out the so-called sort of gangsters who run the, the tobacco stuff, but somehow repositioning in the economy where ordinary people are able, where it's easier for them to make entrance uh, without a bank account necessarily. So many uh, uh, obstacles in the way of, of, of allowing that growth to trickle. We saw also this week enormous starvation and poverty in South Africa, just mm. the actual face and extent of the horror that a majority of South Africans live with, which to me has been the most important part of witnessing this. We can't go back from seeing the starvation and we understand why people looted as well. Um, in a sense, we can talk about the amnesty around that later. Iraq, the economy, what do we do in South Africa? How do we make sure, apart from the stealing that happens at an, at a, at, at an official level, that somehow policies are re-adjusted uh, re, uh, to include ordinary people in the economy? I think there is no doubt, and the, in my view and in, in many economists' view, there has never been any doubt that one of the uh, uh, structural problems that our society has that we are not going to go forward unless we deal with it is this incredible number one world in terms of disparities of income and wealth. And it happens obviously for very good reasons. We know the history of our, our colonialism and uh, all the other stuff that we don't have time to repeat and there's no need to repeat it. What we What we need to do is to deal with it. We do not have to be where we are. We do not have to have the type of disparities that we have. If our government had done what they have to do, and there is no doubt that the, the distribution of access to business, the distribution of access to basic uh, means of what we call it upward mobility of the, of the youth are in our reach. But the, in, instead of putting resources into those type of channels that we know our youth, our, our next cohorts are going to become more capable, more reliant, more self-reliant. What do we do? We steal it from them. What do we do? We cohort with big business, and business is not uh, free here either. They are not innocent at all. The concentration of financial sector, the concent concentration in many other sectors have not been touched. We've talked about, we've written papers about, we have so-called master plan for each of these sectors, and decade after decade, nothing changes. And let me be absolutely clear, unless and until the business and the government, they get together and find a, a time-bound, effective, and uh, reportable, or accountable, or measurable way of dealing with these structural issues, these problems are not going to get better, they are going to get worse. Mm -hmm. To finish it off, Marianne, Human body, when it's got disease, when it's got cancer, it doesn't self-correct. you got to cure it. And the South African body society, body politics of, of, of our economy has got structural diseases. They cannot self-correct unless we put the resources to cure it. I hope that makes sense. But also I wanted to add it, perhaps the resources and the political will. I just want to bring in an example of a country where I see localized economies working, and that's Portugal. Um, you know, uh, very interesting that villages, in a sense, sustain small bakeries, uh, small businesses, supermarkets have to build their, their, their uh, uh, b uh, businesses outside of a village. Uh, but th that's driven by an ideological, social democratic vision for the wider society. And I feel the ANC, that's right, I feel there's your, I feel the ANC is, you know, Mark Hassenkamp has asked, do we really think the ANC is at a turning point? Um, 
uh, what are your feelings around the you know the notion that the economy in KZN needs to change as well? I know you're a journalist, hard to ask you economic questions, but it's hard there. I've been there. I've seen you yeah. know, the unfinished, but I've also seen the the hospitals that Zuma has built, you know, out in the, out, out in the rural areas. So he's been a big man in the area. Um, Marianne, sorry, just I, I, I'd just like to um, give a practical example of what Roger is saying. So um, in KZN, we have at last count, this is for the last um, story that I did for Daily Maverick, we had 19, 937 informal settlements. Now, that is huge if you consider that everyone comprises um, about 300, that, that altogether they comprise about 394,000 informal dwellings. Now, that is massive if you take how many people live in one dwelling, okay? Um, and, it, and the bulk of those are in Etiquini. So we have 584 um, informal settlements in Etiquini, all right, and about 322,000 households, okay? So this has been a constant bugbear of people who work within informal settlements. It's something that I'm quite passionate about writing about and it's something that is changing very slowly. Um, I don't know how much time either of you have spent in informal settlements, but they are not nice. Um, and, um, you know, groups like Abishlali, Bas and Jolo, who are shack, shack settlement movements, have come out in these riots, in these riots, in this insurrection, and they've said, we want absolutely no part of it. Um, they have about 78,000 members. But they are also constantly at odds with the local municipality because very little changes. Um, there is constantly um, corruption within the housing departments trying to get housing. Um, yeah. You know, and and so what Iraj says is just, this is just a practical example of that, is that we need a shared value system. Mm. Um, that It's like a marriage. The only way you make it work is if you marry somebody who has shared values. You know, and um, and until the government and business and South Africa have to and and the, the population have to a certain extent have shared values, I cannot see it working. And we we need to find those shared values in things like prioritizing the poor, prioritizing the elderly. Um, and when I say prioritizing, I don't mean throwing a social grant at somebody. That's important. But um, show me that you care about me by giving me a hospital that works. Yep. You know, um, then my mum isn't going to have to walk through feces on the floor. Um, that's what we need. We need a a concerted, concerted um, just a, a, a moral wake up call. And I'm hoping that that this will be it. I think ideologically as well, the world is post ideological in many ways. And the, yeah. I, the ANC has this idea that it's got the Freedom Charter and all we've got is the Constitution in the end. Yeah. And yeah. I do think, you know, and for me, what's been so beautiful is that, you know, the goodwill is, is there. The response from ordinary South Africans is there. I think the consciousness uh, and placing yourself only minusculely in the, in the shoes of a poor, hungry person is there. Uh, and that's why we have seen such an outpouring. A lot of middle-class people helped during the lockdown. You know, there was a lot of criticism, but at the same time, just the outpouring, we, 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 so in a sense, it's brought people together in South Africa in a way it never has before, because we're fighting a government that's fighting itself. It's most absurd, yeah. uh, most absurd. Um, I think Marian, if I may, yeah. Marian, if yeah. I may, we, we, we in South Africa badly need a radical ethical transformation. Uh, uh, it becomes RET, I know, but it is an ethics of <laughs> yes. governance, ethics of corporate, ethics of managing businesses, and ethics of dealing with people and serving people. Unless we get that right across the society, we are not going to solve the problem. It is not a question that government can do by itself. It requires other parts of the society, most importantly, business lay ourselves, each one of us, so we need an ethical reimagination of what society we want to be. And interestingly yeah. enough, in this type of challenges, it's the middle class and the poor that come to the party much quicker than the rich and the super rich.
That's right. I mean, also just in terms of small things business could do, provide or helping to provide safe transport for people, sponsoring a bus. There are innovative yeah. ways in which to spread your money instead of paying a lot of money to a communications agency to do your marketing on Twitter. Actually, <laughs> give you know. Anyway, you know, Raj, I think uh, we've got about five minutes left. You know, thank you so much. There's almost two thousand people watching. Uh, you've all been amazing. We're all in this thing at the moment. I'm proud of everybody, and I'm shocked by those who. Uh, you know, have sought to destroy us. In a way, I think Jacob Zuma has always been, you know, that part of the ANC has always been in opposition to something. I, I think it's a way of thinking. It's a way of fighting. They speak revolutionary language. It's, it's almost a lot of people here saying, are we going to go the way of Zimbabwe? It's a question people ask all the time. We're not, but, but you know, answer to that because we're not Zimbabwe, everybody, but there are similarities, most certainly. Just, you know, I think speak to that one perpetual question. Are we going Zimbabwe? Are we going Zimbabwe? I believe, Marianne, that we we need to not compare ourselves whether we're going to Zimbabwe or whether we're going to England. The issue is that South Africa has got specific challenges. We know those challenges. Uh, it's not as if that we need more research or more evidence um, on on housing, on education, on urban planning, on agriculture, mining, every other sector. We know what needs to be done. And the sooner we get as a nation we do have the capabilities and the resources, the skills and the money. Despite, despite all the money that's stolen, I believe we still got enough resources to Incredible. take care of our society. <laughs> Therefore, instead of worrying about it, are we going Zimbabwe or are we going um, not? If we deal with the problems, we will be a different society. We will reimagine the society and we will operate differently. If we don't, then we have no choice but to go worse than Zimbabwe. I'm afraid to say it's, it's, it's like a disease in the society. Deal with the disease, you recover. Ignore it and uh, aggravate it. What do you expect? And uh, my belief is that we are at a watershed. We need to pull resources together, not across ANC, FB, DA, and all of that, across a different type of configuration that would look at the, uh, the, the society, the welfare of the communities, and dealing with what needs to be dealt with urgently. So taking it down to the people, which is where the people took it themselves this weekend. If yeah. business yeah. doesn't see that, if politicians do not see that, uh, they're making a mistake because we will remember uh, going forward who was there for us and we were there for each other. It's just been an extraordinary moment of, of, of seeing that. So the electoral reform, the postponement of the elections, I think that you know the ANC does realize it's going to be under threat. There is no real big contender at this point. The political parties, like the DA, does its role in terms of using the law uh, in order to charge people, or, and I think it's done really well. The EFF essentially appears to have lost uh, its own uh, constituency with Zuma having done what they've wanted to do all along. Uh, just final comments before we end. Uh, we, there's so much we could have done. This this webinar will be will be made available later on. I just wanted to thank all of you insiders who support the Daily Maverick. You've been able to help us buy protective clothing for our journalists. You've been help, You've helped us to carry on writing. Um, I just wanted to thank you all and for taking a Sunday night to talk to us, also both to you, Iraj and Des. Uh, perhaps final words going into this week. We need, we need to see arrests. We need to see decisive government in cabinet. There are a lot of people there who've been named at the Zonda Commission still in work. There's David McLobo, there's Arthur Fraser, there's uh, a lot more uh, people who need to answer that perhaps to allegations made to them. But we, we know deep resources, deep pockets, and could serve to foment this. Parting words for a week coming up. Uh, Des, let's, let's talk about Durban. Are you having a few days off? Can you afford to sleep? <laughs> um, I'm hoping to sleep. Um, now, Marianne, I just want to, I need to salute the communities in Durban, whether they're in suburbs, townships, informal settlements, it's irrelevant, um, who have showed us that they will stand together. Um, that it's across racial divides, across religions, that um, that they are willing to build up the country, that they are willing to build up the areas, that they are willing to make their neighborhoods safe. And and what I've seen on the ground this week has been unbelievable. Um, just people who are who are so focused on making it better. And I just I I. I Personally, my mission is going to be to see that energy um, continue in that same direction. Um, it's 
it's it's giving me hope from somebody who almost lost hope this week. It's giving me great hope. And um, just to see that the power really does rest with the people. Um, and I understand that now more. It's always kind of been a catchphrase before, but but to see what I've seen this this week, the power rests with the people. And um, and may the good guys win. Last words, Iraj, the ANC appeals to be an archaeological party. It's going backwards. It's digging, it's digging into its past. It uses the past, you know, it has, or this grouping in the ANC. Can the can can Ramaphosa survive this? And is the ANC able to be changed? And what what are your thoughts from now? Just immediately. Uh I really want to build on what they said. Uh, the, the real power has shifted from so-called leaders to the masses. Mm. If masses, you and I and all other fellow citizens, stay together, share our views, not be quiet or passive, President Ramaphosa is on the same page. We'll win. If we leave it to political parties, whether they are new or old, doesn't matter. If we leave the power to them or delegate our power to them, then we cannot expect anything more than uh, uh, more looting, more confrontation, and more devastation. I'm hoping, and, and I've, I have firm belief, that the South African population, by and large, by far, a very active citizen, very uh, peace-loving citizen across racial groups, and we need to not ignore that. That's what has carried us. That's what was reflected, epitomized in Mandela, and I believe there are literally millions of Mandela's in their own way in the country. We need to come together and support what the president wants to do. That's our way of forward. I think that's amazing. I do think that idea that, you know, I mentioned, I might have said it already, but, you know, in the green room that this week of leading up to Nelson Mandela's birthday was dominated by Jacob Zuma and what was happening around him. And we almost forgot him but at the same time it's the most appropriate thing to have happened in that week because as i said earlier we broke into a million million mandelas on his birthday for him he will be happy uh, he will be smiling he left something as much as people this his legacy as much as people said he was co-opted he was a pragmatic leader who in that moment understood a negotiated settlement we have lived with the effects of that since then but now we know what they are and i just want to thank you iraj constantly for your your ability to, you. to tell us our story to ourselves and to take the time Des, thank you so much for the hard work and all the young journalists i've seen as you say mm -hmm. television journalists radio journalists they've been exemplary our, pre mm -hmm. our press is free and up and running the, we do have another element of the press that is trying to counteract what we're doing but so far uh, it has been an extraordinary week. Thank you, South Africans. Thank you, all 1,706 of you who've watched. Uh, have a beautiful Sunday. Let's go watch the president. I think he's going to be talking to us. And we'll keep an eye on, on the insurrectionists and all the others. And let's go move, move forward in this extraordinary way we have. But I just hope the overseas newspapers begin to write about us differently and to understand what, that, what we see. So thank you to all of you. Be safe. Thank you. And uh, know that we, uh, we're in this together. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. And thank good you. night. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. <laughs> Bye -bye.